Yes, the X27Q basically looks like an office monitor. But below that unassuming black plastic surface, this actually is a very fast gaming monitor. HP got themselves some fast IPS panels from LG and built a plain looking, but functional monitor design around that. And I have to say that I really like this approach as it allows HP to sell this monitor at a very competitive price. But still, the X27Q has some strong competition and I'm especially thinking about the MSI G27 3QF that I just recently reviewed. So of course, we're gonna see how the X27Q stacks up. Backwise, we're looking at a classic 27-inch 1440p IPS monitor with a refresh rate of 165Hz. One thing to note though is that the I.O. is pretty sparse and that this monitor doesn't have speakers. Now, the design of the X27Q isn't exactly eye-catching, though I have to admit that I much prefer this office monitor-like design over those typical gaming monitors that are cluttered with logos and colored accents. And when it comes to ergonomics, the X27Q provides pretty much all the adjustment range you might need, minus swivel. Height, tilt and pivot are adjustable and I kinda like that the display can only pivot clockwise, making it easy to get the screen back to a horizontal orientation. Many of you will also appreciate that it uses a stand with a base instead of legs. The base doesn't extend much past the display and generally it doesn't take up too much space on the desk. Now, let's get into the fun stuff and take a look at the panel. It took me some time to get access to the factory menu, but it tells us that HP uses a panel made by LG Display here. It's a variant of the popular LM270 WQA panel, which also can be found in many other monitors, including LG's own 1440p models. The factory menu unfortunately doesn't give us any insights on which variant it is exactly, but I'm pretty confident that it's essentially the same display that can be found in the LG 27 GL83 as well. So that would be the same panel that's being used in LG's nano IPS monitors, but here the panel is combined with a conventional backlight instead of one that's coated with nano particles. So, as a result, we don't get such a wide color gamut anymore, which with nano IPS monitors typically would be expected to be around the 135% of sRGB mark. The X27Q though has a color gamut volume that's roughly 20% smaller. That's much closer to what we'd call a standard gamut display, as we're only getting about 1.1 times the color gamut volume of sRGB. Now, as you probably know, this comes with the benefit that the stuff you're watching on this monitor doesn't look oversaturated, even if you're not using color managed applications like Photoshop and such. The obvious drawback is that the X27Q can't display white color gamuts accurately. If that's something you can't live without, you probably should go for a monitor with LG's nano backlight instead. The Dell S2721 DGF for instance would be a good alternative. I'll link that review in the top right corner. Now these LG panels are certainly not really known for their amazing contrast ratio and the X27Q really is no exception. I've measured a contrast ratio of 933 to 1. That's actually the second highest value I've ever measured for one of LG's IPS panels, but still a bit underwhelming. By the way, if you like this channel and want to support my testing, I have a Patreon that I will link down below. Now, when it comes to brightness, the X27Q really has a big range. The brightest setting gives us over 360 nits, which is great for bright rooms. And the lowest setting only measures 38 nits, which is really exceptionally low. Meaning we can make the X27Q very dim, so it's easy on the eyes for things like editing a white word document at night or things like that. Now, in a dark room, you will be noticing some amount of IPS glow and backlight bleed. That's just the way it is with these average contrast IPS panels. How much backlight bleed you get largely depends on your luck in the panel laundry. The unit I tested is pretty average in that regard, showing a few brighter spots in the corners, which become a bit more visible in the exaggerated exposure. Here's my sample of the MSI G27 3QF for reference, looking a bit worse than the HP. Safe to say that the X27Q is not the go-to monitor if you're watching a lot of movies and such. In that case, you're much better off with a contrast DVA panel, though the X27Q can still display HDR content, to some extent. I mean, it can handle and display HDR content, but it's just lacking the contrast, color saturation and brightness necessary for the real HDR experience. 
At least though, the X27Q can get marginally brighter in its HDR mode than in SDR, maxing out just above 450 nits, which actually is brighter than advertised by HP. They also don't seem to advertise the local dimming feature anywhere on the website, but in HDR mode, the X27Q shows that it can do local dimming. Now, I counted a mere 8 horizontal dimming zones, which really is nothing to write home about. But yeah, considering the price of the X27Q, the HDR mode is somewhat acceptable and definitely not the worst I've ever seen. Now, just about a minute ago, I told you that the X27Q is pretty much a standard gamut monitor and that this comes with the benefit that colors in its default state won't look oversaturated. Unfortunately though, this doesn't automatically mean that this monitor is color accurate out of the box. Especially the gamma curve is pretty off so that it actually exceeds the scale that I normally use. So yeah, not exactly great. Now with some simple tweaks we can improve a few things, but unfortunately there's no gamma option in the monitor's menu. Though to help a bit with the low end gamma at least, we can make use of HP's shadow boost function. But I honestly rather recommend leaving that turned off and using the ICC profile that I provide in the description down below instead. This will fix the gamma system wide and you can leave black stretch turned off. I put a guide on how to use ICC profiles in the top right corner. Now these are the image quality related settings that I recommend using in conjunction with the ICC profile. You can also just use these settings on their own in case you're using a console for instance and can make use of the ICC. But if you can, I'd recommend using these settings and the ICC simultaneously. Alright, enough about color accuracy, let's talk about gaming related stuff. Now, despite that the X27Q very likely uses the same panel and backlight as the LG 27GL83A, HP bumped up the refresh rate to 165Hz instead of 144 That's of course only a small boost, but I'm surely not gonna complain. However, the X27Q is not certified as G-Sync compatible by Nvidia, whereas the LG is. But after activating G-Sync in the Nvidia control panel, it worked totally flawless in my testing. No flickering or anything like that, even when stress testing the monitor. LFC kicks in at around 65 FPS and generally does a good job as well. So the lack of a G-Sync certification really isn't meaning much other than the fact that we have to manually enable G-Sync in the Nvidia control panel as it's disabled by default. And while we're here, we can enable 10-bit color as well because the X27Q does actually support 10-bit up to 165Hz, which is nice. Next, we're gonna take a look at the response times and motion blur related stuff. And of course, we're using Blurbuster's pursuit camera technique for that. Now, the X27Q provides four different levels of overdrive for us to choose from. At first glance, it's very obvious that level 4 has ridiculous overshoot and should 100% be avoided. Level 3 looks significantly better, but still shows inverse ghosting at the trailing edge of the UFO. So we can get rid of those two modes and have a closer look at level 1 and level 2. Level 1 shows some faint smearing at the trailing edge, Level 2 gets rid of that and looks pretty much perfect. Though with the X27Q, the middle trick shows only part of what's going on. Most IPS monitors show fairly consistent smearing in all tracks, but here we can actually see a tiny bit more smearing with darker transitions and less smearing with brighter transitions. Not to the point that this would be a problem when gaming, but it's definitely a good idea to look at all tracks in this case to really see how the X27Q performs. So looking at the bright track, level 2 really is tuned to the edge. Any more overdrive and we definitely see inverse ghosting here. With lower refresh rates, this starts to become a bit more visible. At 144Hz, level 2 is still usable, but there's already some inverse ghosting visible, especially in the lighter track. Same story at 120Hz, but again, this still is very usable. So if you're using Adaptive Sync with your FPS somewhere in the 120 to 165 FPS range, you can get away with just sticking to level 2. In case you're exclusively using 120 Hz though, like on a console for instance, I prefer level 1 instead. This is especially true in case you're often using refresh rates under 120 Hz as well, because well, take a look at these 60 Hz images. Below 120 Hz and especially at 60 Hz, you definitely don't want to be using level 2 and go for level 1 instead. So unfortunately, we don't get a single overdrive setting that would be optimal throughout the refresh rate range. 
Now, but how does the X27Q compare to other monitors of its class? The MSI G273QF is a very comparable monitor, both in terms of specs and price. And apparently, the response time's performance is pretty comparable as well. The G273QF has a more modest overdrive setup and generally is a bit more consistent across all three tracks. But overall, that's pretty comparable performance, definitely close enough that it doesn't make any differences in game. The same is true in comparison to the ASUS XG27AQ, which is quite a bit more expensive, but basically delivers an extremely similar response time's performance. Now, the ViewSonic XG270QG is one of those monitors that use one of LG's Nano IPS panels, so essentially the same panel as the X27Q, but with a Nano coated backlight instead of a regular one. As we can see, the Nano coating doesn't give the XG270QG any advantages when it comes to response times related stuff. If anything, the ViewSonic has an ever so slightly better performance in the dark track, but a bit more overshoot in the other tracks. So that's really nothing to write home about. Now honestly, it's almost kinda boring that nowadays there are so many fast IPS monitors on the market that are basically all about as fast as it gets for the current panel technology. I mean, the ones I just showed you almost look identical when it comes to this response times related stuff. So the X27Q is just another very fast IPS monitor. Though an area where still a lot of progress has to be made is backlight strobing. Or in other words, on most monitors backlight strobing still is extremely bad. The X27Q is different though. For starters, it provides five different backlight strobing modes each of which can be combined with the different overdrive settings, giving us some room for tweaking. For the sake of simplicity, here's what each backlight strobing mode with the overdrive set to level 2 looks like, which is the optimal setting for MPRT. And I have to say, what we are seeing here is pretty decent actually. Of course, the higher the level, the sharper the image gets. Level 3 though actually looks quite sharp, so I wouldn't necessarily feel the need to go any higher. Especially because higher MPRT also means a lower brightness. 109 nits in level 5 still are usable in a somewhat darker room, but on the other hand, 243 nits in level 3 are much brighter and easily bright enough in a normally lit room, and we still get a pretty sharp image. By the way, looking at these numbers and images, this must be a pretty beefy backlight. Also, it's rather interesting that the X27Q actually gets brighter in its first MPRT mode than without backlight strobing. Seems like HP are restricting the backlight for the normal mode and are reserving the full power for MPRT and HDR. Anyway, in comparison to other good strobing modes, the X27Q holds up pretty well. It gets almost as bright as the EX2510 and only shows very little crosstalk behind the UFO, though the others shown here are a bit sharper. However, if we like, we can still trade in some brightness for more sharpness. This, by the way, is also the only way to reduce the brightness while using MPRT, which is a bit annoying. It's very common that backlight strobing disables the brightness control, but it's annoying nevertheless. Crosstalk towards the bottom and the top of the screen isn't too bad by the way. Overall, with this, we actually got another monitor that has a pretty useful backlight strobing mode, which is always nice to see. Now monitors like the X27Q make the more expensive competition really look bad and overpriced in comparison. You could easily spend about twice as much on a monitor that has essentially the same specs and doesn't perform any better. So yeah, the X27Q is offering a lot for its price, that is hovering around $300 US at the time of making this review. I will have a link down below in case you want to check it out. Now of course the X27Q isn't perfect. I wish it had a high contrast ratio and the color gamut could be a bit larger as well. Also, HP didn't really do a great job with the factory setup here, so the X27Q isn't very color accurate out of the box. But all of this really is minor criticism considering its price and how well it performs for gaming especially. It's pretty much on par with the fastest IPS monitors when it comes to response times and on top of that, we get a backlight strobing mode that's actually usable. Now, the strongest competitor the X27Q probably is the MSI G273QF. It also costs roughly $300 US and it has a very fast IPS panel as well. Coincidentally, it also hasn't the best contrast ratio, but the MSI has the slight edge when it comes to color related stuff. For starters, it has a wider color gamut volume than the X27Q and a better factory setup. 
The X27Q though has the better backlight strobing mode and it comes with a height adjustable stand. So yeah, it's a really tough decision between these two. I put my review of the G27 3QF on screen in case you want to check that out. Both are great monitors and you can't really go wrong with either one. Thanks for watching, man sieht sich im nächsten Video.